8.3, day two, we're still talking about confidence intervals for means. The first part here says, what is the formula for the standard error of the sample mean? And that's SE with a subscript of X bar. And we saw this in the activity. Instead of using sigma over the square root of n, we're going to use little s, which is the sample standard deviation over the square root of n, which is the sample size. So we use this standard error in our formula for confidence intervals when we're talking about means. Right? And we can just simplify this part to be little s over square root of n. Um, so just to keep in mind, little s, that's the standard deviation of the sample data. Right? So it's not like sigma. It's not the population standard deviation. It's just we have the sample data. We take the standard deviation of that data alone. That's what little s is. All right, so how do you interpret this value, the standard error of x bar? Okay, so it's similar to the standard deviation interpretation in that we say it describes how far x bar will typically vary from the thing that we're actually interested in, which is the true population mean, mu. And then how does this N piece play a role? Well, we have to make sure we mention that that's from repeated random samples of the same size, which would be N. So this is a measure of variability. How far X bar typically falls from the true population mean mu? Is it on the formula sheet? Uh, no, it actually isn't. There's some valuable stuff on the formula sheet. Uh, not including this formula. So the formula for a confidence interval for a population mean. So we've got the general one here. Um, the other way we could write it would be to do it without the standard error of x bar, right? We could just write little s over square root of n. Um, unfortunately, it's not on the formula sheet either. So what actually is on the formula sheet in regards to confidence intervals? So all they really give you it says something about a confidence interval. They'll say point estimate plus minus the critical value times standard deviation of statistic. That's all they give you. So as far as means are concerned, our point estimate, what we're building our interval off of would be x bar, our sample mean. Our critical value will be t star. Standard deviation of statistic, in this case, we use s over square root of n. And make sure we know t star has degrees of freedom set to n minus 1. So in general, this is going to be our go-to right here. This is our formula for means. Um, just to be clear and to match the activity before, this is for when, when sigma is unknown, right? The population standard deviation. That's when we don't know it. which would be the practical case. If we knew what sigma was, well, we would already know what the true mean was, too. So we would have no need to make this interval. So for all practical purposes um, and being realistic, we won't know what sigma is, so we have to use s and the t distribution. Um, if for some reason you did know what sigma was, right? So if sigma is actually known somehow, um, just for an example problem, um, it's not practical, but we would use x bar plus or minus z star times sigma over the square root of n. So just as a side note, this one would be applicable if we somehow knew what sigma was. But the vast majority of the time, we're not going to know what sigma is. So we're going to have to use the sample standard deviation, s, and t star to make our interval. So for all practical intents and purposes, this would be our equation for confidence intervals for means. All right, so let's look at the lone example for these notes. It says Milk's favorite cookie. For their second semester project in AP Statistics, Anne and Tori wanted to estimate the average weight of an Oreo cookie to determine if the average weight was less than advertised. 
they selected a random sample of 36 cookies and found the weight of each cookie in grams. So for their sample, the mean weight, X bar, was 11.3921 grams, and the standard deviation of their sample was 0.0817 grams. Part A says construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean weight of an Oreo cookie. And that is the type of problem that we're going to need the four-step process for if we want to get full credit. That's one of those state, plan, do, conclude problems that uses a four-piece grading rubric for each part. So let's make sure we hit each one. So what are the numbers we can pull out of the wording here? Uh, we've got the sample size being 36 cookies, the mean weight for the sample, the standard deviation of the sample. So we want to construct a 95% confidence interval. So let's start with the state step. Okay, so what's our plan? We want to construct a 95% confidence interval, and our goal is to estimate mu, which is the true mean of Oreo cookies in terms of their weight in grams. And I actually need to make some room here because that is an important point to note. We're measuring their weight in grams. And we're looking for the true mean, basically, of all Oreo cookies. Okay, so we mentioned the confidence level, we said what we were trying to capture, and we gave it some context. So we're good for the state step. The next step is the plan step. And we have to meet all the conditions, right? Starting with the easy stuff, right? Let's pick the low-hanging fruit first. So the randomness condition, well, it says right there, a random sample was taken, so check mark, we're good there. So we've got two other conditions still remaining here. First one being normality. And it doesn't say that the parent population of all Oreo cookies is normally distributed. Um, but we don't even need we don't even need that information because our sample size is big enough, right? Our sample size is over 30, so automatically we can say that uh, normality is good in this case due to the central limit theorem. So since 36, our sample size, is bigger than 30, we can assume normality by the CLT, central limit theorem. Last but not least, we have the independence condition, which we should be pretty safe on. I know they didn't sample with replacement, right? I'm sure they ate every last one of the cookies, right? They didn't put them back. Uh, but as far as the 10% condition goes, we we're well under 10% of the entire population of Oreos, right? So 36 Oreos is far less than 10% of the population size of all Oreos. So we're good on the 10% condition. That's definitely met. So check mark. We're good on all three now. So all three conditions are met. That's a green light for us to go ahead and make this interval. And we are going to do that in the do step. So let me clear out some space here. The do step. Here's where we're going to actually calculate our 95% confidence interval. So we know the formula starts with the sample mean, x bar, plus or minus t star, times this s over square root of n value. So we actually have all of these values ready, except for we don't know t star yet. So we need to get that first. So let's focus on t star for a moment off to the side. So we've got 95% for our confidence level. And we need to mention the degrees of freedom for t star. And so since that's n minus 1, well, we'd be looking at 35 degrees of freedom. So if you're someone who prefers to use uh, the chart, you would look for 35 degrees of freedom and the 95% confidence column. But if you're like me, you'd like to use technology. So if we use technology, we can use the command inverse t, I-N-V-T. And all it asks us for is for the area and degrees of freedom. And this would mean area below the boundary. 
So for 95%, if that's in the center of the curve, the boundaries would be at 0 0.025 or 0 0.975. So you can use either one of those for the area and go ahead and use 35 for the degrees of freedom. Uh, and that should get 2.03 for the T star. Also known as our critical value. Okay, so now we've got each one of these pieces. Right, so let's go ahead and start to set this interval up. X bar is 11.3921. We got T star. We've got standard deviation S and sample size. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and simplify this guy right here so I can have one value there for the margin of error. So now I've got 11.3921 plus or minus 0 0.0276. So this orange part right here, that's our margin of error. This one's just got it simplified. Okay, so let's put an interval notation. Take 11.3921, subtract that guy. We get 11.3645. Then you add it to 11.3921, and our upper bound would be 11.4197. So there we go. There's our interval, and we're looking to capture mu, remember, the true population mean uh, for the weight of Oreo cookies. So the last step would be the conclude step. We need to interpret what this is in context, and I hope we're getting good at that by now. The conclude step, so we can start by saying we're 95% confident that the interval from, well, the lower number was 11.3645 to our upper number, which was 11.4197. And you'll notice the color contrast here. I think this is really important because we didn't have to do this for proportions, but now these should have units, right? We're talking about weight in grams. So be careful with that. Um, AP grading will definitely look for you to use units when you're talking about these values. All right, so we've got the first part. We're 95% confident that the interval from this to this, what does it do? Uh, captures the true mean weight of an Oreo cookie. So that's it for part A. Right? We did the four steps. We did state, plan, do, conclude. Uh, and now part B is where it actually gets interesting. We can make some inferences and answer some questions about uh, the company's claims. So for part B here, it says on the packaging, the stated serving size is three cookies, which have a weight in total of 34 grams. Does the interval in part A provide convincing evidence that the average weight of an Oreo cookie is less than advertised? And explain that. Okay, well, first of all, our interval only talks about a single Oreo cookie. Uh, and the packaging talks about three cookies. So first, let's just convert that to be the weight of one cookie, right? So if there's 34 grams for three cookies, that's what they're advertising. Uh, how much would that be for a single cookie? Well, we can just take 34 and divide it by 3, which puts us at about 11.33 grams per cookie. So basically, this is what the company's claiming for the weight of an individual cookie. So if we compare this value to our interval, well, our inter the whole interval is above that. So this isn't evidence that uh, Oreos actually come out weighing less than they're advertised, right? Our interval was actually above the stated value. So we can say since all the plausible values on the interval, right, all these values are actually greater than the 11.33 grams, which was the advertised weight for a single cookie. This wouldn't be evidence to suggest that, for some reason, the cookies are lighter than the company claims. In fact, we're over their claim. 
Right? So based on our interval, there's no evidence. So there's no evidence that the average weight of an Oreo cookie is less than advertised. So the only way we would have had convincing evidence then is if our entire interval was under this uh, advertised value, right? So if all the values on our interval were, were actually below the advertised weight, then we would have convincing evidence that the true mean weight is less than what they claim. So this interval actually suggests the exact opposite. So since all of our values are above 11.33, which was the advertised weight, our data is actually evidence that says, you know, the true mean weight is probably more than 11.33. So our interval actually goes the other way. Since all of our plausible values are above 11.33, that's actually convincing evidence that mu is greater than the advertised 11.3 grams. All right, so that's actually our first example, our first experience with constructing a confidence interval for means. We talked about the formula we use, and we talked about the standard error for x bar, and how do we interpret that. Just in case you weren't thinking about some delicious Oreos from this example, there's an Oreo cake. And that is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.